This video will cover the second part of Unit 3 and the second part of the Neurobiology section. So this will cover the cerebral cortex and the corpus callosum and also some examples of split brain syndrome and how the questions will um, go about asking you how that works. So in the same as the previous video about divisions of the nervous system, this one will cover a lot of the National 5 revision um, or will kind of touch on National 5 revision um, from control and communication. Um, and much like what the SQA um, frequently does, they will change the terms that you're used to using. So this one, we used to talk about cerebrum. We're now going to refer to the cerebrum, uh, cerebrum generally as the cerebral cortex. So we're not really going to refer to the cerebrum anymore. So the cerebral cortex is basically the exterior part, the outer part of the cerebrum. So that bit that you see that's really folded in a picture. So if you think back to National 5, you'll know what the cerebral cortex or the cerebrum, the function of it was. So the function is generally to do with um, personality, conscious thought, memories, all that kind of stuff. And it's still the same here. Okay, so it's the centre for conscious thought. It recalls memories and it'll also, which is something that you don't really think about, but is the case, it'll alter your behaviour based on experience. So for example, if you get bit by a dog, you tend to avoid dogs. You're altering how you act based on what your experience has been. Okay, and that is involving memories as well. Okay. So from now on, we'll refer to this as the cerebral cortex. So what we're going to talk about is the actual structure of the cerebral cortex. And I'll show you a wee quick diagram here. So in terms of a normal brain, when you're used to it in National 5, um, it's very much the same as in higher. So this bit would be the front of it. And then this bit would be the back. This is your medulla here, your cerebellum your pituitary gland, and above your pituitary gland is the hypothalamus, this white space here. The cerebral cortex is this big folded bit here. Now some questions, some A-style questions will ask you to suggest a reason why um, the cerebral cortex is folded. So if you think about back to National 5, um, and even the absorption of the materials part, it's folded to increase its surface area. Um, so if you think about the National 5 part, we talked about the small intestine being folded to increase surface area. This is folded to increase surface area specifically to make more connections. Now, if you think about what's in the brain, it's filled with neurons, so it allows for more connections between neurons. Okay, so that could be an A-style question, suggest the reason why um, the cerebral cortex is so folded. So anything that you talk about things being folded, it's basically the idea is that um, it's to do with increasing surface area for something. Okay, so this whole folded area here is your cerebral cortex. Now, in the cerebral cortex, there's a number of different areas, three main ones we talk about, and that's the sensory, the motor, and the association areas. So if you think about sensory and what you know about sensory, you'll recognise that in terms of sensory neurons and sensory organs, okay, and sense organs. So they receive messages, receive impulses from sense organs. Okay, so for example, there'll be an area in your brain, um, bizarrely enough, at the back, which is the occipital region, which will receive information from your eyes, which is at the front, or just above your ears, it'll be an area that will receive the auditory stuff. So they're all sensory areas that will receive information from those sense organs. Your brain will then process that, and then it will send impulses from what's called your motor area. Okay, so this area sends impulses to effectors. Okay, so that means that you can carry out responses in, so, It'll bring about a response, sorry, so for example, like a contraction or whatever. So if you see something coming towards you and you decide that you want to respond to that, it'll be processed in your sensory area, brought in in your sensory area, but then acted upon by your motor area. Now you also, in your cerebral cortex, have a whole range of areas um, which are grouped under a large heading called the association areas. Now those association areas are to do with a number of things. So they're to do with language, Um, things like personality, imagination, intelligence, etc, etc. 
So all these things that kind of make you interesting, they're involved in the association areas. Now I've not put exactly where those areas are in your brain and your cerebral cortex because you don't need to know that. So you just need to know that there are different areas of your brain that will be responsible for different parts of this. So one part of your brain will be responsible for the eyes, one part for the ears, one part for sending messages to your muscles, one part for intelligence or whatever else. Okay. And that is what's called localization of function. So localization of function basically means that well, you'll have different parts of your cerebral cortex and different parts of your brain which will be involved in controlling or being responsible for different functions. Okay, so responsible for particular functions. Okay. Now localised, if you think about the term localised, you may have heard it in terms of localised pain. So if you think about localised pain, it'd be in a very particular area in your body. So localisation just means in one very precise area. So for example, this area in the back of your brain here would be your occipital region. That's to do with your eyes. Okay, so that would be to do with the function of your eyes and responsible for that particular function. So taking that in and then dealing with it. Okay, you'll have a whole range of areas all around about your brain that will do that. Okay, so that term localization of function just means that one part of your brain will be responsible for one particular function. Okay, so the next bit, which is the main focus of this whole um, part of the topic, isn't even actually what the title of it is. The next part is what's called the corpus callosum. So your corpus callosum is a really common answer for a lot of questions, so you'll get bored of hearing it. Um, the corpus callosum is essentially a bundle of nerves. Okay, now that bundle of nerves sits in between the two hemispheres of the brain. So hemi means half, sphere means a sphere, okay, like a sphere shape. So it's a half a sphere, so each side of your brain is a hemisphere. Now I've just basically said what I'm about to tell you not to ever say, which is side of the brain. You do not refer to them as sides of the brain, you refer to them as hemispheres. Okay, so that corpus callosum will connect those two hemispheres of the brain. Okay, so it connects your left hemisphere of your brain to your right hemisphere of your brain. And it does that so that it allows impulses to pass. Because your brain needs to communicate so it can work as an integrated whole. Okay, so one part of your brain or one um, hemisphere of your brain will have to then send impulses to the other hemisphere. So what I've done is I've drawn a couple of diagrams. So this diagram is the top view. Okay, so imagine your eyes are here. Okay, and this would be your front, and this would be the back. Your cerebral cortex is this bit in between these two hemispheres. This would be your left hemisphere, and this would be your right. This is your cerebral cortex here. Uh, sorry, not your cerebral cortex, your corpus callosum here. Now, on a side view of the brain, you should recognise that this is the front, and this is the back. Now this area here that I've kind of drawn with wee lines on it and I'm shading in red right now, this is your corpus callosum. It's above your hypothalamus. So you should be able to identify that on a diagram. Now there's a couple of points you need to know before I talk about split brain. Um, so well, in fact, there's really one main point. So information from one side of your body okay so for example your left eye or your left hand you would logically think it'd be processed in your left hemisphere but it's not bizarrely enough okay so information from one side of your body is processed in the opposite hemisphere Okay, so the opposite hemisphere of the brain. Right, so if I'd said left eye and left hand, the information is coming from either the left eye or the left hand, it'd be processed in the right hemisphere. Okay, so for example, right now I'm writing with my right hand. If I was to I don't know, jab myself with a tack on my right hand, the information from that right hand would be processed in my left hemisphere and vice versa. 
Okay, so when you always think about the sides of the body, you then think about the opposite hemisphere of the brain. Okay, so it's always the opposite hemisphere that it's processed in. And that's also the same when it comes to control. So the left hemisphere of my brain will control my right hand. I know that gets a bit confusing. Um, and it's confusing when we talk about things like the heart and the left side being the right side and whatever else. So it's the same idea in that. Okay, so next what I'm going to show you is an example of what's called split brain syndrome. Now, if you've watched the videos, then you'll know what split brain syndrome is. Um, there was a great video that shows how people with split brain syndrome are very, very different to us, but they're not really aware of it. Okay, so split brain syndrome basically means that the hemispheres of your brain cannot share information, so information from the left hemisphere will not go to the right and vice versa. Okay, and they work independently, so they will process information and then we'll send out information independently of the other hemisphere. Okay, and the reason that happens is because either you're born without a corpus callosum or it has to be destroyed. So some people that um, have severe epilepsy will get their corpus callosum cut so that the impulses won't pass right across the brain. So I'm going to give you what looks like a really bizarre diagram right now. So this diagram shows a person in the top view of the brain. So this is their left eye. Okay, and this is their left side. And this is their right eye and their right side. Okay, this is therefore the left hemisphere and this is the right hemisphere of the brain. Now, in questions that are about this, you'll be told that the left hemisphere of the brain is responsible for speech and the right hemisphere of the brain is responsible for movement of particularly the left hand. Remember, right hemisphere of the brain will control the opposite side of the body. Okay? Now, in a normal person, if you had a connected brain with an intact corpus callosum, an image with these two words would be flashed up in front of your eye, or your eyes, and then your brain would connect the two. So it would say that you had seen the word teaspoon, okay, or you would point to a teaspoon. Now, people with a corpus callosum don't have that, or without a corpus callosum, sorry, don't have the ability to share information between those hemispheres. So, in this example, a person in their left eye will see the word T, okay? But their left eye is processed in their right hemisphere. So the word T goes to the right hemisphere. So because that person's right hemisphere is responsible for moving to the left hand, if that person was asked to point to what they'd seen, they would point to T. or they would pick up a bag of tea or a tea bag or something like that, okay? Or they'd point to a tea kettle. Now, in the other side, so the other visual field, the right eye would have seen spoon. And that right eye would send impulses to the left hemisphere of the brain. And therefore, spoon will go to the left hemisphere. And because the left hemisphere is responsible for speech, they would say spoon. Now, in a normal person, quote normal person, you would link the two together and you would see them as a whole. Your brain would communicate, the hemispheres would communicate, and they would then see the whole thing teaspoon. But this person without a corpus callosum, the information spoon cannot pass from that left hemisphere to the right, and vice versa. You can't pass that information T across to the left hemisphere. So the person would not point to spoon, and they would not say T. Okay, so once you've seen me explain this, and the same with the next example, you might want to go back and watch that split brain um, syndrome experiment again and see if you've got a better understanding of it now. Now, the next example I'm going to give you, um, I've got some written explanations for it, just so that you may want to have it for um, trying the, the homeworks and other kind of explanation questions for it. So this is another example of a split, uh, split brain patient who's had two words flashed up in front of their face. So again, this is the left hemisphere, and this is the right hemisphere. So face, the word face, is seen by the left eye. Okay, and it goes to the left, from the left visual field into the left eye. Now that left visual field is processed in the right hemisphere. 
So that word face is seen by the right hemisphere. Okay? Now, in the same idea, the word book is seen by the right eye, and that right eye sends the impulses to the left hemisphere where it's processed. So that word book goes to the left hemisphere. Okay, so that's what I've got here. So information from the left eye, which is the word face, goes to the right hemisphere. Okay, now the right hemisphere controls the left hand like we've got here, so therefore they would point to something that represented a face. So they would point to a face or the word face. Now the right eye sees the word book and that goes to the left hemisphere. Now your left hemisphere is responsible for speech so that person when they are asked to say what they saw will say book. Now, if it was any, quote, normal person that had an intact corpus callosum, if you looked at both those words, you would combine it both together and you would say Facebook. And you point to maybe the symbol for Facebook or something like that. This person does not have an intact corpus callosum. Okay, that connection between the two hemispheres is broken. So, information can't be transferred from that right hemisphere to the left hemisphere. So they cannot say what they see in their right hemisphere. Okay, so if you look at the right hemisphere, they've got face. They cannot see face. Okay, and inversely, information from that left-hand side, or sorry, the left hemisphere of the brain can't be transferred to the right, and therefore they can't point to what they had seen in that left hemisphere. So they can't point to the word book. Now, when it comes to questions that you'll get, you'll either be asked to explain it, like I've got here. Um, it's quite a lengthy answer, but I'm kind of covering all bases. Or you'll be asked a multiple choice question, just very simply, what would a person say they had seen? Okay, or what would a person point to in this example? Okay, so you really it can be really quite complex if you get a bit jumbled up with it. So maybe have a look at that video again, and then come back to this. Okay, and the cerebral cortex stuff is quite short. It's mainly to do with the corpus callosum. Okay, and that's us done for that.